Welcome once again to the worship service of Heartland Crossroads Cooperative Ministry, a United Methodist Cooperative of six small membership town and country churches. I'm Pastor Bob Klingler. I'm with two associates, Pastor Gary Wade and Pastor Matt Randulik. My daughter Emma helps us with our worship music each week and my wife prepares the worship spaces. We're glad to have you with us. I wanted to share with you some connections to our ministry. Uh, first, you won't be seeing Pastor Gary again today. Uh, both he and Pastor Matt are tent-making ministers, which means they also work a full-time job. And Pastor Gary was out all night uh, plowing the roads and taking care of things. He works for the township, so he wasn't able to make our recording time today. So you won't be seeing him this week, hopefully next week, depending upon the weather. This is a, a wintertime thing. We do have a website, heartlandcrossroadsministry.org heartlandcrossroadsministry.org. You can go there and you'll find the words for the music from this morning's service and other information about our churches, including addresses and such. On Monday evenings, we offer a Bible study on Facebook Messenger. You can contact me and I send you an invitation to the Messenger Room. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount with Amy Jill Levine. It's a wonderful study. We are enjoying it immensely. Uh, you can jump right in. It's, uh, you know, anybody is welcome. We'd be glad to have you with us. On Tuesday evening, we have Musical Vespers. Pastor Matt does that on Facebook. It's also at 7 o'clock. You can tune in 7 o'clock. On Facebook, Pastor Matt doing musical vespers that are really good. Then on Wednesday evening this week, Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., our Staff Parish Relations Committee, known as SPRC. SPRC will be meeting in a Zoom conference. So just a reminder to SPRC members, I will be sending you a link. If you don't get one or you haven't received an email yet, please contact me and I'll make sure that you get that. All righty. Our soup and pie sale at Valley United Methodist was once again a wonderful success. Went through quite a bit. Coming up in three weeks on February 13th, we'll be doing that again. So look for that. Uh, great soups once again. You'll have a choice of three soups and a number of great pies. And you can pre-order those and we'll give you that information as we get a little bit closer. One thing I do want to say... Our churches are struggling right now financially. It's been a difficult time. I know it's difficult for a lot of people and a lot of institutions, uh, a lot of businesses and things. We are struggling financially and really need folks to step up with their offering. We give you the uh, addresses every week during the offertory in our service. They're on the website. Please, please consider sending your offering because our church is really needed at this point. Uh, this is the time when we have our regular ministry expenses plus bills pile up for heat and such in the wintertime. So please, uh, things are, are getting very dire in a couple of our churches. Please consider sending your offering. Do thank you for coming to worship with us today. Let's go now and worship and celebrate. We begin our time of worship with... I will call upon the Lord.
do. Well, hi there, boys and girls. <laughs> yeah, it's really good to see you again. Yeah. Say, uh, you ever gone fishing? I got invited to go ice fishing, but I, mean, I didn't know why you'd want to catch ice. I mean, you can get it from the freezer. Anyway, <laughs> it seems that some of the disciples were, were fishermen. Yeah, the ones who followed Jesus, those, those guys, they were fishermen. Yeah, and, and they were out there fishing in the boats, and they, they didn't fish with fishing poles, I guess. They used nets. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair to catch a lot of fish with a net. But anyway, they were out there with the nets, and, and Jesus came by, and, and he wanted to talk to a whole bunch of people, so he, he asked them to let him go out in a boat, and he stood there in the boat, which doesn't sound real safe to me, but he stood up in the boat and he, he taught people all kind of cool stuff. And, and then he looked at the disciples and he said, I want you to follow me. And, and they said, yes, because the things he taught were so cool. <laughs> yeah, they were kind of amazing. Jesus teaches really neat stuff about loving each other and helping people and being a good person and all. And well, they heard that. They they were used to people being mean to each other sometimes, and, and Jesus was teaching them to treat each other nice. And even when people were mean to you, you were supposed to, to love them anyway. And lots of things like that. And boy, wow, they just <laughs> they thought that was pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool too. So then he sent them out and he said, I'm going to have you go fishing for people. I don't think they used nets. No, I think they used love. <laughs> when we treat people with love and we're nice to them and all, they see Jesus in us. And, and that's really good. We want people to see Jesus in, in the things we do so that they can come and, and love Jesus too. That's really cool. So, if you're gonna go fishing for ice, well, be careful because it's cold. But if you're gonna fish for people, just love them because that's nice and warm. We'll see you again. <laughs> Jesus loves you too. That's good. Bye folks. Uh, yeah, that's just, that's really good. I love it. <laughs> we continue our time of worship with open the eyes of my heart, Lord.
as we come to our time of joys and concerns for this week, we begin with our concerns. Uh, Reverend Lisa Grant up in Edinburgh has been dealing with shingles and she encourages those who uh, have not gotten a shingles shot to go and get the shots because the shingles have been uh, very painful and uh, giving her lots of problems. So keep her in your prayers. We want to pray for the Cox family, Jenny and Rob and their family. Jenny has mast cell disease. It's a very rare disease and, and has a lot of complications. So we want to continue to pray for them and all of uh, the needs that that disease presents to their family. A co-worker of Scott's was out skiing and was hit by a snowmobile that was traveling at a high rate of speed, had a badly broken leg and a lengthy surgery to repair the bone. So prayers there as well, please. Our dear Emma is an occupational therapist and one of her patients at school um, has a surgery um, that has not been healing properly. So we want to be praying for that patient as uh, um, we know that we that they need that healing um, to move forward with their life properly. And on that same kind of note, we want to continue to pray for the teachers, students, and families. Um, Many of you know, as you probably have kids and grandkids and nephews and nieces that are involved in school at this time, everything is complicated with COVID and um, the complications of learning online as well as the different socialization, all of that stress of the family, you know, is, is much different than it was just a few months ago or even a year ago. We want to pray for these families and the teachers because life is just so different and we want God to give them strength. Amen. As we come to our time of joys, we have a number of friends who are thankful because they have begun to receive the vaccines for COVID, and that's a good thing that the, the rollout has happened. Talk to some folks who are uh, scheduled to receive theirs, so that's a, a very positive thing. We have uh, several friends who are recovering from successful surgeries, and we always want to give God the thanks for that, the healing power that he has given to them. Amen. And a friend who is dealing with some pancreatic issues, the, the meds that were given for that are working, and it's always good when the treatment works and, and people start to feel better. We're very grateful that Terry Herendine is starting to feel much better from the bronchitis that she has. The cough has been lingering, so we want to keep her in our prayers for that, but we are just happy that she's recovering and, and making a, a good recovery there. And we're thankful once again for a, a successful soup and pie sale on a very cold cold day and uh, <laughs> and also and for little for, furry creatures little furry us. creatures who <laughs> yeah I want to drink my water uh, <laughs> and for all those who are celebrating birthdays or anniversaries this week we, we give thanks for each and every one that is a true joy why don't we go ahead and take a little moment of silence to offer these intentions up on our own as well as join in a moment of prayer to conclude this time together God who has authored all of existence into existence, who has created all and who has given a creative spirit to all, we thank you for the opportunities to be intermingled in each other's webs, in each other's stories, to be characters um, in each other's narratives, to be able to um, not only be concerned for one another, but to be able to issue joy for one another in the healing that we receive and the, the pleasures that we receive and to be proud of one another and the progress that we go through. We are reminded that you made yourself a personal God, a God of personal relationships through Jesus when you came to earth and humbled yourself. You took away your God-like stature and adopted the presence of a servant, um, a human, a slave even, as Philippians says. And we remember how you walked with the apostles, man to man, mano a mano, human to human. You cared for all of your disciples, just as you care for us today and inspire us to care for one another today. And because of that, we are glad to sing the prayer that you taught us to sing. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I forgot one joy. I did find out earlier today that uh, my Uncle Bobby that we had prayed for a couple weeks ago is back home and doing very well. Excellent. So thankful for that go. as well. Just we'll have that joy. There you go. <laughs> can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pay. Living fear to fear Laughter hides the silent cries Only Jesus hears People need the Lord People need
Today we continue with the narrative lectionary into Jesus' life and teaching, and we learn about his interaction with the disciples. You can read along with us from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Listen to the gospel of Christ because it's living and active and can inspire us to change and renew our lives even today. Luke writes, Once Jesus, when he was standing on the shore of Lake Genesaret, the crowd was pushing in on him to better hear the word of God. He noticed two boats tied up. The fishermen had just left them and were out scrubbing their nets. He climbed into the boat that was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Sitting there, using the boat for a pulpit, he taught the crowd. When he finished teaching, he said to Simon, push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a minnow. But if you say so, I'll let out our nets. It was no sooner said than done, a huge haul of fish straining the nets past capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come help them. They filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. Simon Peter when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave. I'm a sinner and can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. When they pulled in that catch of fish, awe overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. It was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, co-workers with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, there is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They'll, they pulled their boats up on the beach, left them nets and all, and followed Jesus. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. This passage is great because it shows kind of the normal people that Jesus reached out to. I think it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, even within Christianity, we know that Jesus reaches out to normal people and even sometimes subpar people. And really, when you're talking about fishermen, these are like, and I don't mean to like degrade any kind of population, but these are like the, the transients, maybe even like those old 70 movies of what you might think of like truckers being like the people that are just traveling from town to town so they don't have to worry about reputation and they may do things that are less than reputable. You know, not, I'm not trying to say that truckers are less than reputable. Or but some were just day workers. Yeah, you, you know, know that those, kind of thing. You know how those people like have that reputation of being less than reputable. Yes. Like or they're portrayed yes. that way in movies. Well, those were the people that Jesus was around the fishermen's you know they were not seen as respectable citizens you know nobody wanted their child to grow up and be a fisherman especially the fishermen they wanted their children to grow up and be better kind of like we want our children to grow up and do better than we're doing and here jesus is around these people you know they're not necessarily of ill repute but they're not of much repute you know and jesus is hanging out with them and teaching them Different than other rabbis. Most rabbis look for students that show potential and that are really intelligent. We even see this sometimes in our churches. Not so much, like I haven't witnessed this in our co-op, but when I was in other ministries, we would definitely like recruit harder the younger families with kids that had a little bit extra money. You know, that that kind of thing. Like churches like, oh, they're a good family. They have <laughs> both of them are employed and you know their kids are good. And like they they see the potential of them bringing the right kind of people in. And Jesus was not interested in that obviously from the beginning. He was just like, here are people I'm here with people who cares what kind of people. And I think that this is an incredible testament already just in the setting to who Jesus was. And this is before Jesus goes even lower in the pot in his ministry when he starts dealing with tax collectors like Zacchaeus, yeah. when he starts dealing with prostitutes, when he starts dealing with Roman murderers and soldiers and that kind of stuff. So it's interesting, you know, he starts here with just really regular people slash what we would consider maybe below average reputation kind of people and Jesus is teaching them in all seriousness and these people are listening and soaking up what Jesus is teaching which is exciting they are traveling you know um, to hear Jesus speak on a lake or on a boat and you know this is incredible because people today don't do that even for very famous people. Often we have to go to arenas and these well-organized kind of places. 
And yet, here Jesus is just speaking on a lake, and many people are gathering around. And then likewise, Jesus kind of makes this whole ministry become apparent to Peter in a way that is visual and able to be understood for all of us. And that's basically, look, you're dealing with your physical desires right now. You're trying to feed your family. You're trying to make a buck. You're trying to, you know, make some profit. But I'm going to tell you something that is more important. You're going to be looking for people and people are going to bite and people are going to jump into the net with the message that I'm telling you. And we should wonder, why are they doing that? It's because the message is so unique and so different than anything. And maybe e even anything that honestly our Christian churches have preached in a long, long time. And that message is that God values you more than anything in the cosmos. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter who you've been around. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you will be. God values you as you are in your weakest moment more than anything else that he has created. This message resonates with me and it resonates throughout history, certainly. It also teaches us a couple other practical things that I want to go into as well. One of them is that um, it's overflowing when you preach mm -hmm. this message. When we feel like our churches are failing, I think that we should evaluate ourselves and say, are we really preaching the radical gospel that Jesus mm -hmm. gives? Because sometimes we, um, not only do we whitewash the gospel, this is something that I remember throughout this Martin Luther King Jr. week that, um, you know, when I read these quotes, I often read people quoting Martin Luther King that probably would never invite him to his house because they would have thought he was a radical uh, communist. Um, and they don't really... But he's get, dead, so he's safe. Yeah. yeah. And they, they quote, like, the minutest, like, nicest thing that he said rather than some of the things that are, like, punch you in the gut, kind of make you rethink your whole life kind of thing. Jesus had those quotes, too, and we don't say them enough in <laughs> yeah. church. You know, between you we and me. We ought to, yeah. 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 But on the other side of that, you know, um, there is this evaluation that we should have. If we think our churches are failing, failing, I honestly think it's because we don't love people enough. It's because we're not opening up our souls and our lives to people that we consider sinners. Because Jesus instantly did that. Um, you know, when Jesus was in um, uh, existence on earth, um, they didn't talk about people that we now call like part of the LGBTQ, um, like the queer community. They didn't talk about transgenders. They didn't talk about race because there wasn't much of a race divide. There were Romans, Jews, and then there were Africans, but they didn't really talk about them. But if Jesus were here today, um, Jesus would be talking about the people that identify as queer or transgender. Uh, he would be talking about all these different racial divides and trying to deal and trying to help those who find themselves at society's lowest, you know, divisions of those divides. Um, and his church would magnify and multiply in seconds. So when I think and I hear often from our leaders and people that genuinely are concerned that our churches are dying, sometimes I honestly want to say, well, have we tried loving people that we find disgusting? Have we tried finding drug addicts? Have we tried finding alcoholics? Have we tried finding gays and lesbians? Have we tried finding people who don't speak English? Um, have we tried finding all these people, the prisoners, people that Jesus, just last week we said Jesus would teach, would set the prisoners free. free. These are guilty people convicted of their crimes. You know, have we tried to do that? And I just wonder if maybe our nets would overflow too because those people are desperately looking to find a net to be caught in because the net is Jesus's love, right? God's love, God's validation, God's care. That's the net that Jesus is talking about, that Peter is calling. And the other thing that this message brings to me this evening that I think about, um, this morning that I think about, today, uh, today, today. that today. I think about, <laughs> is that they had to call in help back up. And I think about our co-op. And I think about how well positioned we are, you know, if 
even just one of our churches would be so radical in their love, they could call in help from one of the other five churches and say, our nets are overflowing, come help us. Come help. And then our church could be the same way, our co-op could be the same way with other churches in the area saying, you know, like maybe, you know, like the work that EUMA is doing, Yuma or, you know, in Erie. in Erie is doing, or maybe other organizations, you know, like we're doing with Ramps of Hope and stuff like that, you know, we're yeah. already kind of doing this. Christianity takes cooperation and we're set up so well with this co-op to do that. And I just wonder if maybe we need to constantly be thinking about the cooperation that is necessary in Christian community. Well, Rams of Hope is a great example because it started with just a couple ramps, mm. but the need is so great that there's you know, well over a month of backlog mm. that they cannot get to people. There are you know, dozens of ramps that are the people requested that they just can't get to. And that's the literally, nets are overflowing. Yeah, that's literally just Peter saying. <clears throat> Come, neighbors, come, come help us pull these nets in, you know? <laughs> it's interesting. Each of the gospel writers has a, a very different point of view. They're, they're stressing different things for different reasons. Uh, Mark's gospel was written first. Mark was very likely Peter's secretary, his scribe. And as you get to Peter's death, Mark doesn't want the story to be lost, so he writes down very concisely the things that he has learned as he's watched Peter for all these years. If you Mark look at wasn't a Mark, Mark is mostly red letters. It's very much speeches of Jesus and yeah. speeches of Peter. Everything Peter has taught him, he's you know he's writing all this down. Matthew, on the other hand, is uh, is very Jewish and he's very tied into the Jewish scriptures, which we would call the Old Testament, and he ties in all the prophecies through there and the people from the Old Testament into the things that Jesus is doing and saying. So it's a very Jewish perspective. Uh, John's gospel is completely different. John is concerned more that people understand that Jesus is God and the Son of God, and so it's and what we call high Christology. Yeah, sometimes he's borderline heresy, like he's close to where the Gnostics are pulling from. Yes. And then there's Luke, and Luke, we believe, was a physician, but at, at this point, Luke is operating as a historian, mm -hmm. and he tells you that up front, and he has been listening and gathering together. This is, this is late when the disciples are dying, uh, long after Jesus' ministry and Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. He's gathering all these stories together. He's gathering as many stories as he can find from different places. He's looking at the letters. He's listening to everything. And he's writing out this history. And he wants to be as detailed as he can with some things. And that's where he, he becomes different than Matthew's Gospel, for example, in this particular one. But even historians have kind of a, a, a bent. to they have, they have certain things that appeal to them. And Luke's gospel focuses on Jesus' ministry to the folks on the margins. Mm -hmm. That's Luke's focus. It's why Luke is my favorite gospel. And Adam Hamilton has said, you know, it's his favorite gospel. Because it's dealing with the people on the margins. He kind of gathers those stories and those teachings of Jesus about loving those folks. And so you have this detailed story today that Luke has set out. And it's different than Matthew's account of the same story. Matthew tells it very quickly. Jesus is walking along the beach. He sees them with the nets. He says, follow me. They drop the nets. They go. And there's no context. Luke gives us context. Jesus comes along. There's a crowd starting to gather. The boats are there. Sound carries better over the water. So he says, can I get out in your boat? So they float out a little way. He teaches this crowd. And the fishermen with him are listening to this teaching. And he is kind of the rock star rabbi. Uh, he's the young guy. He's got this new teaching. It's powerful. People have been flocking to hear him. He's, uh, he's extremely popular. In that region of the Galilee, everyone wanted their boys to grow up to be rabbis. So he's a rock star in this community. And they're listening to this teaching, and it's powerful. And Jesus gets done, and he looks at Simon Peter, and he said, uh, I want to see how you fish. Let's go out there, and you can throw out the nets. Peter's going, <laughs> you know, we, we fished all night, we didn't catch anything. You know, if you want fish for lunch, you're not going to get it this way. This is not going to do it. But Jesus says, come on, just show me. So they go out there, and they throw the nets in. Of course, there's this giant catch, and they've got all these fish, and it's overflowing. So you have this powerful teaching, and then you've got this incredible miracle that happens. And they see this wonder in front of them, and... Peter is just overwhelmed at this point. He, he just 
he can't take it all in. It's too much for him. And remember, these were young boys who had originally been on track to be rabbis in school, but weren't good enough. They flunked out. And so he feels that, you know, that he is not worthy. And Jesus says to them the one thing that they had longed to hear growing up. And that was a rabbi saying, follow me. Hmm. Follow me. That's how you became a disciple of a rabbi. And for Jesus to say that, I mean, he is the, the rock star rabbi. For him to say that is enough. And yet they've heard the teaching and the power of the teaching. They've seen the miracle. And now the invitation. And that gives it context. And of course, they say yes. I mean, why wouldn't they at this point? It's incredible. And then he throws the curveball. I'm going to teach you to fish for people. And that's, that's the one. That the, I'm sure they were wondering what on earth he was talking about at that point, but it didn't matter. They heard the teaching. They saw the wonder. They got the invitation. They followed. A lot of times what we have to, to say to people is come and see. Come and, and meet this Jesus. Come and see. Come to, to the fellowship. Come and experience the love. Uh, Andy Stanley points out that we were all fish once, all of us who were within the church. We were all fish once. Somebody, somebody fished. And because of somebody else, we're here. And that's what it is. As we reach out to people, as we care about people, as we love people, as we accept people where they are, we're fishing. We're fishing. And it's not with a hook. It's with a net. You know, it's, it's attractional. We are attracting people, not dragging them in, but attracting people to Jesus. Because Jesus is the best thing there is. And we have that good news that the folks on the margins are part of the family. And y'all come. Come and see. Come experience. Come be loved by Jesus and his family. Amen. Amen. Go Luke. Jesus told the disciples that they were going to become fishers of people. And so we sing, Go to the World. joined us this morning for our virtual worship. Now, between you and me, we know that virtual is just a word because we still truly worship God when we are filming this together, but also when we're observing this as a church body too. 
We hope that you've been blessed this morning, and we hope that as you leave your place of virtual worship, that you continue to bless others. You have such a huge influence. You may not even know it, but you influence people each moment of your waking day. So in those moments, bless them. Make sure that you cast your nets far and wide so that more and more fish come and experience just that radical love of Jesus. Be blessed by God who has named himself love, Jesus Christ who has demonstrated that love through his sacrifice on the cross and his gift of resurrection, ending death for all, and Holy Spirit who constantly brings us to God's grace in peace. Be blessed. Amen. Thank you.